Blood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there, and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Didi Hussain. Before I introduce today's guest, I remind you all to subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel, like the video, share the video. Leave a comment. And of course, if you're an avid podcast listener, you can find this episode on all the usual podcast audio platforms. Today's guest is someone who I personally find very funny. And for those of you who have followed all the podcasts, know that I'm an avid cynic and critic of Muslim comedians. But believe it or not, today's guest who's joining us all the way from New Jersey, the United States, is someone whose sketches I've been following for some time. She's a social media influencer, she's a comedian, and I hope she gives us as much bants as I get from her and her Instagram, and that's none other than our dear sister, Nadira Pierre. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Sam, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I feel a bit, I think I'm a bit edged now, because I don't know when you're going to, when you, I don't know when you might even take me out. I don't know if the podcast goes, if the podcast goes uh, haywire, I don't know, there might be a video on your Insta taking me out. I hope that's not the case. Hi. I can't make any promises, but we'll see. Oh my goodness. How are you, sis? How are you? Good? Good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Very well. Thank you for giving up your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly a pleasure. It's all mine. Yeah. Is that why you kept us waiting for nearly an hour for you? Listen. But it's true though, really. You I, have I to thought... be clear about the time. I was like, yeah, 10 p.m. tonight is fine. And then you emailed me and I was like, wait, where's he at? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Sister Nadira, I've been, uh, believe it or not, for the last year or so, mm-hmm. I came past your sketches. Uh, my wife showed it to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason why that is, is because I don't find Muslim comedians funny. Generally mm-hmm. speaking, I don't. I think the main reason for that is, is they've all milk the whole kind of I'm a Muslim kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. And, there's, and, and there's even certain boundaries which they cross, which I don't think is uh, Islamically correct. But when I came across your sketches yeah. on Insta, I, I was, uh, yeah, I, f- I found them quite funny because, yeah, you take out the brothers, but you take out the sisters as well. Everyone gets taken out, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so at what point did you decide that this was going to be a thing? Like like you that like sketches and, and 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 funny short funny videos. When did you get involved in all of that? Um, so I started probably around three or four years ago. Um, but when I started, it was like just for my family members and friends. Um, like it was like nothing big. This was nothing. Where I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this and this is gonna happen. Um, and then it, I always tell people it was like a lot chose for me because I was in school. I had other dreams. I had other plans. I had other things going on. Um, but then once I went viral the first time, I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. That's cute. Um, and then it just kept happening. And then I got into stand up, and I was like, okay, I guess this is the thing now. I guess this is what I'm doing. So it's probably only been about two or three years. It's been like a good year of being on social media, of doing stand up before it was something that I really committed to. Uh, so are you actually, you're, do, you're doing stand up shows now. Oh uh, yeah, I am. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in terms of your audience, uh, is it mixed or is it still predominantly Muslim or predominantly black? Um, it still is predominantly Muslim. It still is predominantly black. Yes. And when you first started, or even mm-hmm. up until now, do you still get kind of frowns and kind of like maybe this is not something that's befitting for a Muslim woman to be doing? Do you still get? Did you ever get any of that? Um, at the beginning, yeah. Uh, because I'm sure you know, as a UK Muslim especially, how Muslims can be. So at the beginning, when people are like, oh, you're taking yourself out the fold of Islam, like, oh, oh this is wow. not right, all of that. So at the beginning, I definitely struggled with that because I was like, okay, am I? Because if I am, I'm really good at it. <laughs> so I feel like a lot would be like, what are you saying here? Um, but I feel like after I found out what I need to find out and I consulted with a few people, I've laid that to rest and I haven't felt that way since. Now, naturally, just as a person that's on social media, I do have to check myself every now and again mm. because I'll be like, okay, that is funny. That's a really, really funny, but that's a bit much. Okay. <laughs> that's a little bit too much. It's, it's taking things a little too far. And when you do that, so, so, so that as an example, as an anecdotal example, have you done a sketch where you're like, you know what, that is, that, this is funny. But I'm not gonna put it out because I'm possibly crossing certain boundaries. Uh, yeah, that's happened for sure. How, how often does that happen? 
it does not happen often now um, because when I record a video, I watch it back multiple times. So when I watch it back multiple times, before anyone else sees it, I'm like critiquing it and taking it in and all of that. Um, so yeah, not many times, but there are a couple times where I'm like, okay, no. I, as soon as I'm about to hit like upload, I'm like, okay, no, let's just, let's just let it go. Let me just call one of my friends and tell them this really funny joke that nobody else needs to know about. And do you review it with any other family members or friends who are like, give you their counsel and advice? They're just like, uh, you, you do it yourself. I do have a couple of friends, um, but family members, not so much. You know, on the, on the topic of comedy, right? Yeah. Um, the stuff that I've seen of yours and the stuff that I specifically find bare funny of, of yours is basically when you kind of, in a, in a very brazen, blunt, candid way, about the cringiness of Muslim couples, how, cer how certain brothers roll, yeah. uh, either when they're moving on sisters prior to marriage or if or, or as newlyweds, that you 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 like you done a recent one about yeah. about a sister who marries a brother and goes onto Instagram oh, and, the, yes. and, and, the, and then starts blocking people like why are you following me you're only following yes. me and the, like that was very funny so thank you, know, these, thank you. So, so is this from so are these things from experiences or like things that you've heard that happens commonly. Um, I would say about 98% of them are my personal experiences. Okay. Um, and then about 2% of them are like stories I've been told. And I was like, this is crazy. Like I got to post a video about this. Cause that is absolutely outrageous. Do you still start, do you still stand by that being in love should be something that's regarded as clinically? Insane? Absolutely. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Come on, man. That's harsh, man. But is it wrong? Okay, but hold on. Are you talking? Are you talking about? Are you talking about someone who gets stupidly soppy in love prior to marriage, which has many problems, or even when it continues into marriage? I think both. Um, I think both of them are a beautiful thing, but I feel like they're equally as dangerous. It might be worse once you're actually married and like you're actually living with the person. I feel like that that could get that could get a little worse. Okay, it's but funny. Yes. That, it's funny that you say that. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it's a statement of Umar ibn Khattab or Abu Bakr radiallahu And either way, mm -hmm. the correct one I'm going to post it on the video once it comes out. Yeah. It, it actually says, paraphrase, not to love someone so much. Yes. That that you become crazy about mm -hmm. them, or that you hate them that much, where you basically can't have a balance with them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess what you said has some precedent in that. It does. It does, and I feel like nobody. <sighs> mainly because of, of the history of their very specific type of poetry about love. Like the Arabs know yeah. crazy love. Like they yeah. know insane, I'm about to cut my own fingers off yeah. <laughs> type of love. So if anybody knows, they know. Just since you, since, cause you mentioned the Arabs, I might as well just mention there's two stories yeah. from ISIS, yeah? There's one story of someone at the time of the Prophet who did who, who didn't want to go out to Military campaign And one of the reasons What he stated Was that I fear the beauty Of the Byzantine women Example number two There was a I'm not sure I don't think he was a companion But there was someone At the time of the Prophet Sallam Who actually gave up Islam Because how much he loved And became a Christian Because of how much he loved The Byzantine women There was even a, Another story At the time of the Salaf Of a man Who loved his wife so much She was a Khawarij So a bit on the extreme spectrum Yeah He, beca he became one as well And she excommunicated him After marriage <laughs> So there is there is this crazy blind love which yes. kind of makes you uh, a bit irrational when it comes to certain things. You know your stand up. I've never seen your stand up. I just see your Insta content, right? Yeah. Is it kind of focused around Muslim relationships or are there other areas which you explore? No, I made you a joke or two about uh, Muslim relationships because they're so very outrageous. But for the most part, we're talking about all the other regular stuff, nested politics and, and everything like that. And you know when you you know when you talk about masjid politics is and, and, and the other topic, is that again something which you've experienced or observed or seen for yourself? Yeah, something that I've definitely experienced. Um, and again stories that I've heard. Because I feel like even though I've been in like some really crazy situations, I just know with Muslims it gets crazier. It is crazy, like to the point where you're like, "This is outrageous." That's there's no way that that happened to you in the masjid, but yeah, do you things address, are actually that crazy. Have you have you addressed uh, anti-blackness within the Muslim community? 
amongst Desian Arabs? Quite a bit, quite yeah. a bit, yeah. Um, I don't really make videos about it anymore, only because it's something that um, hasn't really been in the forefront of my mind as much as it was like when you go look at my previous videos. But yeah, I've definitely talked about it, and I'll definitely talk about it uh, on my story quite a, quite a bit. And is it something that you've experienced yourself? Yeah, of course. <laughs> when was, is it like an everyday passive thing, or are they kind of overt incidents? That are quite. Um, it is no longer an everyday passive thing because I'm not as integrated in those communities as much as I was before. Um, but it's it's definitely still prevalent. Uh, I definitely still have experiences that will remind me of a previous experience. You know what I mean? So then I'll go and I'll talk about it, but not as much these days. Alhamdulillah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Can you share one of those unfortunate ex experiences, if you don't mind? Um, man, what was the most previous one? I think still, and it's, it, that's something that is kind of ongoing. Seeing non-black Muslims out somewhere and they will like do everything to avoid giving you the salams. Like not even, and it's to the point where not even to avoid giving you salams, but like to avoid making eye contact with you, to avoid just even crossing paths with you. Like I was walking in the mall and you know when you can like, you can sense when another Muslim is around. So I'm walking and lo and behold, here one comes. Yeah. And it's like, we made quick eye contact. And I kid you not, like you would have thought somebody was chasing her. She like fully turned around so quickly and like went the other way. And I was like, okay, that's that's super weird now, because now you just went all the way around to come in the same aisle. That's weird, but yeah, l little things like that. And uh, what's the feedback been on your content from non-black Muslims? Um, I think it's been fifty-fifty. It's been fifty percent of people who are like, yeah, I definitely understand. I see where you're coming from. Uh, people who've seen it, uh, people who have been the perpetrators of it. And I think the other half who is completely oblivious, uh, I wouldn't even say it's oblivious. They're kind of like in denial. That exists. Or, yeah, or they're, they're just coming out and just blatantly lying and saying that it doesn't happen or it hasn't happened. And then of course you have the people that are like, oh no, there's no racism in Islam, blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, no, just a no, mixture of that. No, no, it definitely exists. There's not denying that. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd be you'd be ignorant of reality uh, to deny that. I mean, Allah removed that disease from our hearts and minds. I mean, I mean. Um, you know, when I started today's podcast and I said that I generally don't find Muslim comedians funny. Yeah, there's, there's a reason why that is. It's because you know in the UK scene, yeah, Muslim comedians have just totally rinsed the whole Muslim identity thing, right? Okay, yeah. And the thing is, you know, when you see other non-Muslim mainstream comedians, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Bar look, don't hate on me or anything. Bar women, I do, I do find a lot of female comedians do focus on them being females, right? Um, mm -hmm. Again, there's no statistical data to prove what I'm saying. It's just my observations on the on the comedy sketches and stand up that I've seen. But generally speaking, non-Muslim comedians, they don't really folk their niche, their USP. Wow, I'm spitting all over my t-shirt and everything. Um, <clears throat> their USP isn't the fact that. They're white, they're male, they're middle class, working class. They seem to delve into all issues. Mm -hmm. Sociopolitics, economics, religion, sports, you name it. And I find that for Muslim comedians to break into that scene, for those who are pursuing careers in the mainstream, they end up doing two things. Number or both of these things. They end up doing number one, mm -hmm. they they really, really transgress boundaries about what is what is permissible or not uh, Yeah, I need the clear things Like Don't mock religious practices Right uh, mm -hmm. Where there's a basis For in the Quran and Sunnah And yeah. these are things Which the Prophet ﷺ Handed over to us And Allah has decreed on us It's yeah. not really something To really mock Right Yeah um, Or They will literally Repeat and rehash The same stuff Because Their entire uh, Premise of their content Is around the fact of Muslim identity So whatever's The whole kind of terrorism jokes The whole kind of Allahu Akbar jokes It's been rinsed yeah. It's been rinsed so badly And it's cringe Because I know That they're doing it Because 
whether it's they have a shortfall in having that skill set to address or satirize other issues, but they seem to just want to do it around Islam and Muslims. And I just think, well, hold on, if non-Muslims are smashing it, not going into their personal attributes, why is it the case? I've seen black non-Muslim comedians mm -hmm. who don't always focus about racism, who don't mm -hmm. always focus about them being black. They talk about other issues, but it's something about Muslim comedians, they seem to fall over themselves about just rinsing the Muslim card. Um, and that's why I said I don't really feel Muslim comedians. It's the same stuff rehashed over again, the airport jokes, the, the, the security jokes, the, the Schedule 7 interviews, saying Allahu Akbar, and these kind of, it's the same stuff. Have you, seen, have you seen a similar trend in the US, or is it just a UK thing I'm describing? I do think it's more of a UK thing, but again, I'm biased because I know so many different comedians um, that I actually do think are good, that I actually do enjoy. But honestly, from what you're saying, I find that to be prevalent, like no matter the industry. And I always go after like um, Muslims that are in like the fashion world and that are models and all this. And they're like, yeah, I'm hijabi. And it's like, okay. So like, what do you do? I'm a hijabi. And it's like, all right, what do you do in your free time? I'm a hijabi. It's like, I feel like, um, to be honest, and maybe it's different in the UK, when it comes to kind of how we're brought up, we're never really taught or told or really even just explained to what it means to have a personality and to develop a personality alongside being a Muslim. Because they're taught that, like, being a Muslim is a personality trait. It's not. As we can see, because you can be a Muslim and be a bad person. You can be a Muslim and have a horrible personality. You can be a Muslim and be generally unpleasant. So the whole time they're like, oh, you need to act like a Muslim. Well, what does that mean? Well, what does that look like? And it's like when you're not fasting, when you're not praying, when you're not giving charity, when you're not at the masjid, who are you? What do you do? What do you enjoy? And really, I feel like it's crippling that Muslims like stand behind their identity of like, oh, yeah, I'm a Muslim, especially for comedians, because it's like, OK, we get it. You're Muslim. Now, what else? But also um, on the other side of that, you have, like you said, the comedians that step way out of boundaries. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the media, because I've definitely experienced people wanting me to come and perform. But once they find out. You know, I don't talk about drugs or alcohol or clubbing or sex and I don't curse and all this. Then they're like, oh, we're not really that interested because yeah. it's like, oh, you wanted somebody that is visibly Muslim or somebody that's telling you they're Muslim to clearly do things oh, that I'm are sorry. not within that. Yeah that, are, yeah, that are outside of that fold. Yeah. And, you know, when you said about it's interesting that you mentioned about the, the hijab fashion industry, because that's essentially what it is now. We've got a whole catalog of hijabsters uh, who have literally um you know they they may have some have even they started off uh showing some conservative values you know and then literally came off got their brand got the blue tick on insta and now they're anything but what is seen as modest industry or modest clothing mm -hmm. um, do you feel that the hijab industry and the muslim women's industry in fashion has been co-opted and been commercialized um, because others would argue, Nadira, others would argue, well, hold on here. Surely having sisters in hijab in a bikini or in the tightest of clothes, in some inappropriate clothes, or, you know, doing things. Look, just for some clarification as well for our viewers and listeners, what's, yeah. commonly, what's commonly regarded as the hijab, commonly regarded is the headscarf. Yeah. But yeah. in reality, hijab is a concept of modesty, it is a concept of uh, the overall, right? Um, yeah. As opposed to as opposed to just a single garment on your hair, so when you start seeing hijab hijabsters and 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 influencers doing everything that's an antithesis to the hijab, right? And they would argue that would hold on here. We're pushing it on the mainstream. It's going to become more acceptable when yeah. you see more, when you see more Muslim sisters in hijab coming up on the Vogue or the Playboy magazine or wherever it may be, right? Um, People will connect with that and not want to attack you on the streets. I've heard these arguments, right? Um, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I do think naturally so, like like any industry uh, in the Western world, 
they're going to do everything they can to exploit and to capitalize off of it, no matter what. So I do think to a certain degree, is hijabi, modest fashion being exploited and capitalized off? Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, as a Muslim woman, I still hold tight to the fact that it is still ours. And I think when we, when we talk about hijab, you know, I am one of those Muslims, that I feel like hijab does not have a singular meaning, but it looks like so many different things to so many different people. So for all Muslim women, however you would like to um, say like, oh, you know, this is my style of hijab. Okay, cool. That's between you and Allah. Allah knows, you know, the truth about your heart and about your intentions, so fine. But I, I definitely think there's so much exploitation going on. Um, I definitely think the whole modest fashion industry is doing everything they can to capitalize off of it. But I definitely do also believe that Muslim women are starting to catch wind of that. And we're starting to kind of backtrack things. Because that and is... Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's, you made a very important point. We have to own it, right? Yeah. Like, whether it's the hijab in this specific case or whatever it may be. Yeah. I think, I think there's, there's certain outward symbols that are synonymous to Islam and Muslims. It's something that we should at least be taking a frontward role in how it should be projected to to the wider society. Uh, and you're right in in capitalist society, which is the entirety of the Western world, right? Yeah. Is that anything that can you can make a quick buck off? It'll it, it'll be done, right? It'll they will, yeah. It, it'll be repackaged, it'll be commercialized, all kinds of muddy waters, and boom, that's it. You're making millions, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Your your Instagram moving mm -hmm. on to social media. Your Instagram, you're on about, if I lost correct, you're about 89,000 or 83,000 mm -hmm. followers, right? Um, but the YouTube game's a bit slow. Yeah. Is this, is this something specific? Is that because you're not focusing much on YouTube or is it because you prefer Instagram as a preferred platform? Um, I think it's because YouTube is very new. So it's like, I'm still trying to figure it out. And it definitely, oh my gosh, it takes a lot more time. It than does. Instagram. Instagram is like, you know, a quick post, quick six second video, quick live, quick story. Whereas YouTube is like, okay, we're taking an hour of footage and we're only getting a 15 minute video. And then you got to post this many times a week and all of that. So it is definitely slow growth, but I'm, I'm, it's something that I definitely enjoy more than I thought I would. And, um, you know, with social media generally, whether it be Facebook, Snapchat, Insta, TikTok, yeah. all of that, are you on TikTok? I'm not. No? When you're hitting I one. watch TikToks, but I don't make them. Yeah? How come, how come you've not jumped onto the TikTok scene? Um, it's a lot of work. Yeah? It's so, it's so intricate. I'm, I'm still trying to learn it. Because people are like, oh, you should get on TikTok. And I'm really still trying to decide if I even want to. Okay. Because I feel like I'm already managing these three others. I don't know if I want another one. Uh, that's, uh, if I'm correct, that's basically YouTube, Facebook, and Insta, right? Right. And... Um, How's the family been? How's the family been with you doing all of this? Supportive generally? Um, they were very skeptical at first because like I said at the time I was in school, I did have other things going on. So when I told them I'm like, yeah, I guess, you know, I'm a social media person and I do comedy now and they're like, what? Like, you just went through all the school and I was like, yeah, I know. But anyway, <laughs> moving forward. Um, but how did that, they've definitely warmed up to it after after them having, having like other people notice me okay. like we'll be out places and they'll be like oh my god did you pee? and my dad is like <laughs> <laughs> how do you know my daughter <laughs> so alhamdulillah alhamdulillah uh slow but steady progress do you have, you have you ever had brothers coming up to you in front of your dad uh yeah uh -huh. and i'm just like <laughs> get away from me <laughs> walk swiftly but my dad you know my dad is not worried about it he he understands so you know, he'll take a picture or whatever he, he has to do. And uh, has, he, uh, has he ever fed back to you about your content? Has he ever watched any of your content? Or does he regularly watch your content? Um, he does watch my content. Does he find you funny? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Surprisingly, yeah. <laughs> my dad is definitely a, a critic. So if he didn't, he would let me know. So where do you, where, where do you get your banterism from? Is it, is it, is it, does your dad, is he quite a, a banteristic guy as well? Um, I would say yes. I don't find it funny, yeah. <laughs> but other people find it funny. So yeah, but I think my uh, it's more so my grandmothers. Okay, that are really like the jokesters of the family.
Let me ask you a question. Um, are you married? No. Uh, when that time comes, inshallah, uh, mm-hmm. are, you, are you looking to continue this, carry this on? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? I, I feel like when I get to that point, it's only going to get funnier. Because okay. now it's like I have a live-in <laughs> joke. <laughs> <laughs> and what you're gonna you're gonna tie the you're gonna tie tie the poor guy into it as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh god, oh god, that's gonna that's gonna be an interesting development in the world of Nadir P, man. <laughs> I it's, hope we it, can handle it. It's uh, it's interesting that at the beginning of our conversation, you said some, you said to me, as you well know, because you're from the UK. UK Muslims and Brit- UK Muslims and US Muslims, they have certain perceptions of each other. Yes. Right? I think you're the fourth American guest that we've had on the show, yeah? Yeah. And and, and the general perception, the general uh-huh. perception, right, that Muslims in the UK have of the US Muslims is that uh, nauseatingly patriotic. Oh, uh, Nauseatingly patriotic, love them, love waving that flag, love ha- love having the uh, love having the whole kind of uh, U.S. flag hijab and all of that. Okay, right. Um, bit uppity, bit bit posh for their liking. Uh, you know, socioeconomically more thriving than their British cousins across the pond. Okay. More more willing to live amongst non-Muslims uh, as opposed to living in smaller kind of congregated uh, areas. Right. Yes. Um, and generally more kind of open to liberalism and just just a more kind of a liberal woke mindset. And I know our, our Yankee brothers and sisters think of the Brits as quite sectarian, quite hardline, quite harsh. And 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 and, and, and as one very famous Dai said, I'm not going to mention it because you guys are quite ghettoized. You know that you guys are quite, <laughs> quite 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 insular, right? Uh-huh. Now now this. Again, there's no data or nothing to substantiate any of those claims, but I know these perceptions they they yeah. exist. Have you heard these uh, these stereotypes uh, of of Americans and the Brits as well? I just want to tell you now because I feel like if it comes out, this is going to get back to you. Yeah. But I had a tweet a couple months ago yeah. um, where I said I feel like UK Muslims are crazy yeah. because they're forced. <laughs> To live in those closets and call them homes. Oh, good lord! How dare you! How dare you! Right off our beautiful <laughs> winter brick homes, yeah. Have you seen the size of the United Kingdom on a map compared to the United States? And I feel so sorry. I feel so sorry. Now, when you say we are more willing to live amongst non-Muslims. I don't understand how you're not when everybody lives <laughs> right next to everybody. <laughs> but um, no, no. I think, I've okay, okay, let me rephrase that. I think, I think what I meant by that is that when you come, I I know areas like this exist in Michigan, in Detroit, in New York. I I know yeah. I know you get air, entire hoods which are predominantly Muslim, right? I get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But literally, you will come to the UK and you'll go to London, Birmingham, Manchester, the North, and you'll be like, raw. Which country am I in? Like, like, like which Islamic yeah, state? Yeah, have yeah. I, which Islamic state have I arrived in? Right, yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. Right, but uh, and 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 Muslims actively in the UK, many I would say, an overwhelming majority want to seek to actively live amongst other Muslims. Right? Yeah. Um, whereas with Americans, they're more kind of they're more open to the idea that yeah, we're cool. We could live in the suburbs with the white folk. It's not a problem. Um, don't have to necessarily be ghettoized in the hood, right? We can live amongst we can live amongst non-Muslims and white folk and mix with them nicely, even if they don't want to mix with us. Yeah. Um, when I say when I said also about the susceptibility to certain liberal thinking, yeah, like that's something which exists amongst most Brits when they when they look to America, even amongst the Mashaikh and the ulama and the Duat. Bar Bar dons like Siraj Wahaj, uh, of the Allah. Beside dons like that, there is this kind of mindset that Americans are just. Just liberal woke hippies. Um, I'm not saying it's true. I'm not saying I believe it either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but you're I've only. Defi- pre- I've definitely heard those uh, those perceptions of us, but I, I also remind people that how can I say this? A lot of the experiences that you're hearing about in the UK 
pertain to, for the majority, non-black Muslims. Agreed. It's very different for black Agreed. Muslims, almost to the point where I'm like, I feel like we live in, once you look at the politics of like redlining and everything, we live in two different, we kind of live in two different Americas and we experience two different Americas. So the whole thing about, oh, patriotism, I have experienced that amongst non-black Muslims. Amongst black Muslims, not nearly as much. And, and that's why specifically I give a shout out to Imam Siraj Wahaj May Allah bless him, preserve him I mean from New York who, who is one of the dons since day And, and did some big boy dao in Brooklyn and that yeah. uh, you know, and, and you know there's other that So I definitely agree with you that what I, what I described Is not necessarily attributed towards black Muslims in America yeah. Who were the first community of Muslims yeah. uh, in the US So you're saying that you've observed this mainly from non-black Muslims, yeah? Yeah, for sure. Why do you think that is? If I have to be honest, I think it is in an effort to be white, to pander to the white gaze, to assimilate to whiteness. Um, and I feel like that's something that's not addressed nearly as much in the community. Um, is that there are a lot of non-black Muslims who want to be white, who want to know what it is like to experience whiteness. So whatever they see white people do, that's what they'll do. To know, uh, to know benefit of themselves because they end up doing all that. And it's like, you do know that white people don't want you here either, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like right. the second, 100%. you know, they, that, you know, they have on the American, uh, the American flag hijab and, you'll still go in the airport and they're like, hey, you've been randomly chosen for a screening. It's not working. <laughs> Let yeah, it go. 100, 100, 100. And what the interesting thing is, when we, uh, your observation generally is correct, because when we do look over to the US, the more kind of radical, uncompromising politics and dawah and activism does is actually coming from the black Muslim community uh, in yeah. the US. Uh, but it's also interesting because as someone who's of Bangladeshi origin mm -hmm. uh, From the South Asian Desi community In the UK We're quite hardcore We hold it down yeah. I'll be honest with you we hold it. But when we look over to Our folk over the US We're like yo man What is going on there Because that, that, that kind of level of Kind of uncompromising radical politics And activism It's not coming from Desis and Arabs in the US Generally yeah. speaking It's not It's coming from the black Muslims in America but in the UK, you come here and you see that the people, the Muslims who are generally holding it down in the UK are the South Asian Desi communities. I mean, there's there's a whole discussion about why that's the case. It could be to do with socioeconomics. It could be the fact that the Desi Arab communities in the US are relatively new diaspora communities, whereas here we're much longer, well established. There's various things. It could yeah. also be it, it could also be to, be to do with where those South Asians and Arabs come from. In their respective countries and where we come from in the UK, yeah. it, it, there's there's a plethora of things which I which I think uh, affects how you deal with uh, politics, activism, and dawah. But you've mentioned something interesting, and I'm gonna mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump onto it as our concluding topic. Whiteness, yeah, blackness. These are languages. I'm not. These are words or concepts. I'm not saying that you've come from this perspective, by the way. Yeah. But when you hear the word whiteness or Blackness. This is is a language that's tend to is associated with uh, the left. Uh, whether it's critical race, whether it's a certain kind of Marxist or socialist thinking, I'm not saying that's the perspective you're coming from. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that you know when the George Floyd murder happened last year at the peak yeah. of, at the peak of COVID nineteen, there was a whole discussion taking place amongst blacks in America and blacks in the UK mm -hmm. about right. Where do we draw a line, if any, where there is long-lasting, historic, institutional uh, oppression of blacks, right? Yeah. But where do we draw that line where, okay, those who are steering the popular mass movement are coming from an ideological premise which isn't Islamic, right? They tend to be hard left, Marxist, pro-LGBTQ, and many things are quite overtly haram. So I know there's a whole conversation that's happening in the US and there's a whole conversation that's happening in the UK amongst black Muslim communities. That yeah. 
Number one, how do we influence this from the standpoint of faith? Number two, do we get to a point where we have to distance ourselves from our fellow black counterparts because they're simply coming from a paradigm which isn't Islamic? Have you heard these conversations and debates taking place? Um, I have heard these conversations, um, but I have to be honest in saying that I'm not interested in partaking because when we're talking about systemic racism, when we're talking about, we're not talking about passive oppression of a group of people. We're talking about it's very active. We're talking about people are dying every day. Um, we can get to the conversation on separation later. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's an issue of a person or, or an organization that is actively harming others, with their mindset and their ideologies and, and different things like that, then of course we can separate them from the movement. But when it comes to liberation, when it comes to freedom, when it comes to all of that, I am with that um, for all people. For all people. So it's like if you're if you're a bit you know hardcore, a bit more hardcore than I am or than I'm used to, then we can talk about how to soften you up at another time. But right now, I feel like it's it's more important that we stay focused, and it's more important that we stay unified. So let me so, so let me present to you a scenario, yeah. Yeah. Let's say you know the Black Lives Matter movement, right? Mm-hmm. The founders they are people who individuals who admittedly said, "Look, we're we're, we're neo Marxists, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we support uh, we support abortion, the, the unequivocal right for women to abort." We support uh, queer intersectionality and LGBTQ, yada yada, and all these all these kind of things. But at the same time, our main objective, also as it currently is, is systemic and institutional racism and oppression and police violence and against black people. Do you think that Muslims should at least move with a bit of caution, or do you still think that what is priority is the fact that blacks are being killed, and therefore that's priority number one? And we can discuss these things later. Um, I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the US, we have uh, separated ourselves from the Black Lives Matter, uh, kind of like them as an organization. Like I said before, when it comes to you doing actual harm in that moment, we have to separate from you. And again, I don't know, maybe uh, you guys are different in the UK, but in the US, the leaders and the founders for the most part of the Black Lives Matter movement have proven themselves to be quite harmful. Yeah, so, so black Americans have moved away from that. But I think I think with any movement, whatever it may be, you have to be cautious. Because I think even look at us as Muslims. Mm. Even though it's like, yeah, you're a Muslim, you have to be cautious of other Muslims as a Muslim. So it's like you have goals, you have uh, things, goals that you're trying to meet, you have things in place, you have things that you're trying to get to, and you have these people that are claiming to stand alongside of you. But as people, we know everybody doesn't have the same intentions. Everybody doesn't have good intentions. Everybody doesn't have a good heart. So I, I wouldn't even say for Muslims, but I think for everybody, period, no matter what organization, what group you belong to, you should always move with a bit of caution. Wicked. That's a wicked not to kind of wrap today's podcast up, but there is something else I want to ask you. Please. I, I asked you this off camera. I asked you whether you were a convert or a born Muslim. Yeah. Right? Um, and you said you were a born Muslim. When, where do you trace your Muslim lineage back to? My maternal grandparents. Tell me a bit about them. My, actually, my merch. Okay. Well, my mother's parents met in college and i do believe together they had i'm not really too sure how but they had come to learn about islam um and then they ended up becoming muslim and then after they became muslim they got married but then also at that time my great-grandfather my grandmother's father uh also became muslim alhamdulillah alhamdulillah and 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 you know, did you hear about this story? I, I, mean, I know you just met that your your grand your maternal grandparents they got married, they looked into some, they became Muslim. Yeah. Was, was this kind of during the Black Civil Rights period or before that? Absolutely. Yeah. During that period, yeah. Yeah. So you know, when you look into the Black Civil Rights movement and you look at the kind of the various thinking and strands of approaches, 
Yeah. <clears throat> would, would you say you're more of a Malcolm X sister or a, or a Martin Luther King sister? Um, I do not pick one because I think that they are more alike. They are more alike, or they were more alike in many ways that people don't know about. Um, so I think both because <laughs> they were they were both with everything. <laughs> Wicked. This is It was an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you so uh, much. Pleasure was all mine. Alhamdulillah. Nah, nah. Alhamdulillah. The 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 the, the forty five minute one hour wait for you was was well worth. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, take care of yourself. Keep us in your du'as and it was an absolute pleasure. And inshallah, we hope to have you soon in the near future. Thank you. I mean, I mean, praying the same for you guys. Salam alaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Brothers and sisters, I hope you enjoyed this today's episode with Sister Nadira. Uh, please check her out on her socials. Uh, remember to subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel. Like this video. If you don't like this video, Sister Nadir is going to drop a video taking you like out one time. So you better like this video. Leave a comment. Subscribe. Share. And until next time, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Blood Brothers Podcast. Five Pillars Production. <laughs>